disaster can strike an unsuspecting aircraft for many different reasons. When it does, no one wants it to happen. But that's not always the case. Some incidents that air investigators are called to solve turn out to be deliberate. These are the disasters that someone, somewhere, wanted to happen. This is a public safety announcement. For your protection, never leave your personal belongings, carry-on baggage, or parcels unattended for any reason. Also, never take another person's baggage or packages onto an aircraft with you. Report anything questionable to the nearest airline employee or airport police officer. Thank you. When deliberate damage to aircraft is suspected, the air investigators play second fiddle to the criminal detectives. That's what happened on December the 7th, 1987, when 43 people took off on Pacific Southwest Airlines Flight 1771 from Los Angeles. It was due in San Francisco at 4.43, but it never arrived. Putting together the puzzle of what happened to Flight 1771 was to shock even the most grizzled detectives. Good evening and thanks so much for joining us on this Monday, December 7th. We have lots to tell you about and we will lead off with what is apparently a plane which has crashed near Templeton this evening. The plane went down about 425, we understand, and we have no confirmation. Well, I'm the uh, sheriff, coroner, and marshal of San Luis Obispo County an area of 3,300 square miles. Well, on the way uh, to the crash site, we uh, received information that uh, there was possibly gunshots involved. Uh, I assumed uh, that maybe gunshots were from the ground up. The first detective to arrive at the scene was Bill Wamuk. I couldn't comprehend at first that this was something larger than perhaps a, a small a single engine uh, private aircraft and I kept thinking perhaps he was carrying newspapers it just seemed to be nothing but papers blowing uh, gently in the wind uh, hanging in the trees uh, the thought never occurred to me that it was actually bits and pieces of a large aircraft a commercial aircraft bits and pieces of, of, of passengers luggage and in some cases bits and pieces of, of a human being. The plane came down uh, about 10 degrees over vertical uh, at about 720 miles an hour when it hit the ground. There was nothing that had any shape to it that was recognizable. Uh, most things torn and jagged, uh, small pieces. Uh, in the most cases, uh, no, no, no larger than, than, a, than a man's hand. We found uh, personal belongings, driver's licenses, uh, credit cards, pictures of family members. We put them in plastic bags, labeled them with the grid area which we were searching, and, uh, and turned that uh, over to the coroner. Parts of bodies would be placed in one bag. Uh, any evidence or uh, uh, parts of a plane that they thought was of some significance placed in another. On the second day of the search, investigators made a vital find. Amongst the millions of tiny pieces of wreckage was what looked like the trigger and barrel of a handgun. On the morning of December 9th, a, an FBI agent located that gun in the tree area behind me, uh, and I was at the time standing at that tree. Uh, he brought it to my attention without disturbing it. I stepped over to where he was located and we did confirm uh, uh, that it was a what appeared to be a 44 Magnum uh, stainless steel handgun. But who did the gun belong to? The way the detectives found out was remarkable. In the serration uh, of the trigger, we found that there had been an accumulation of skin, as if the gun had been ripped 
from the uh, index finger area and some skin had been included in those ridges. The tissue was rolled out, flattened out to see if we could find fingerprint ridges, thumbprint ridges, palm prints, anything that we could possibly identify to somebody's known fingerprints. Meanwhile, the FBI had been checking the passenger manifest of those who'd boarded Flight 1771. On that list was a man named David Burke, whose fingerprints were on file. We were able to determine that that skin was in fact the fingerprint of Mr. Burke. Now investigators had a suspect and a weapon, but they still needed a motive. The FBI soon discovered one. Burke had been fired by the airline just two weeks earlier. David Burke was terminated for stealing $69 from the aircraft cocktail fund that the flight attendants uh, maintained. He appealed his termination and had a hearing scheduled on December the 7th, which is the day of this incident. At 2 p.m. in the afternoon before Ray Thompson, uh, who was his supervisor, and at that time, David Burke learned that his appeal was not uh, being granted. As he left the office, the secretary to uh, Ray Thompson at the time uh, remarked to David Burke uh, in an effort to ease, I believe, the tension that was in the office, will David have a, a good day or words to that effect? And he paused upon leaving and looked at her and said, I intend to have a very good day. With that, Burke went to buy a ticket for flight 1771 to San Francisco, a flight he knew his boss, Ray Thompson, traveled home on daily. And with his ticket in his hand, Burke went off to get his gun. David Burke smuggled the gun on the aircraft using his uh, identification as an airline employee to circumvent uh, the security and allow him entry into the secure area with a, with a weapon. And that identification was found at the scene of the crash. This is the kind of gun used by Mr. Burke uh, that he took on the airplane and fired it in a very confined place. Uh, this is a 357 Magnum. He used a 44 Magnum, but in all other respects, uh, they're exactly the same. During our uh, investigation on the scene of the crash, we recovered a uh, air sickness bag. And on that bag was written a note, obviously addressed to Ray, we believe Ray Thompson. I was startled by that because things were blowing all over the place, as I said, seven, eight miles away in a very large area. And we had what appeared to be millions of pieces of paper out there. And the note uh, we have determined, the laboratory, the FBI Identification Division has determined was written by uh, David Burke. The letter or the note said, hi, Ray, it's kind of ironical, isn't it, that we end up like this? I asked for leniency for my family, remember? Well, I got none, and you'll get none. What finally allowed the detectives to piece together the last moments of Flight 1771 was the discovery amongst the wreckage of the cockpit voice recorder, the so-called black box. After overnight analysis in Washington, the tape was rushed back to the crash site. When we got the tape back uh, from the contents of the black box, uh, I was out on the scene and we found a car that had uh, a tape player in it. So several of us, uh, the head of the FBI and others, uh, sat to see what had happened in that cockpit. Through the analysis of the um, voice recorder, we heard the door to the restroom right next to Ray Thompson uh, open and close just seconds before the first shots were overheard. We believe that Ray probably received the note from David Burke as David Burke went to the restroom and that he then came out of the restroom with his revolver unsheathed and that he immediately shot Ray Thompson. The next thing that you could hear on the tape was uh, the, a door opening 
and a, a female voice saying something to the words of there's a problem. You could hear either the captain or the co-pilot ask what the problem is. You could hear another male voice say something to the effect of, of I'm the problem. And then there are additional gunshots. The conclusion that we've come to is that Mr. Burke entered the cockpit and executed both the pilot and the co-pilot. And then there is the sound of the plane increasing in speed as it's heading toward the ground. Obviously, Mr. Burke has got the controls at this point. And then, uh, all of a sudden, there is an additional gunshot. And then there is dead silence. I, I can't imagine uh, being a passenger on that airplane, knowing that this man had just fired a shot, and then knowing that you're hearing another shot, and then knowing that the plane is going down, and, and you have no time to even, to even lean over to your loved one and say, I love you. From the time the first shots were heard until the time of impact of this aircraft hitting the ground, approximately 47 seconds elapsed. Those were 47 terror-filled seconds to the passengers aboard flight 1771. This entire incident uh, took place because Mr. Burke was fired for stealing $69. It was a mass murder. It was a suicide. It was a plane crash. It seems like a very significant disparity be between $69 and the loss uh, of this aircraft and 43 people. Just bring your arm around. Yeah. In the early 1970s, explosives expert Walter Korsgaard was asked to set up a counter-bombing unit for the body which regulates America's flying industry, the Federal Aviation Administration. Part of my job there was making speeches around the country. And uh, in the process, while I'm talking about the bombers, I would build a device to show how anybody could do it. I would buy the, all the components right in the town where I was. And little by little, it would come together. And of course, what I would attempt to do would be to set the clock, the timer, if you will, so that the bomb would go off of course, not like a regular bomb, but with a good flash and a little booming and some smoke uh, to get the audience's attention. In the late 1980s, Walter Korsgaard was to be a key figure in solving the puzzle of one of the most enduring tragedies in civil aviation. On December the 21st, 1988, a Pan Am 747 came down over the small town of Lockerbie in Scotland. Pan Am 103 was on its way from Heathrow to New York City. As it reached its cruising altitude of 31,000 feet, a bomb the size of a sugar bag blew the jumbo jet from the sky. Minutes later, all 259 people on board and 11 people on the ground were dead. No suspect has been tried for those murders. The question, why not, is the one most despairingly asked today. But that wasn't the first question facing investigators a decade ago. At four o'clock in the morning, uh, I got this phone call. The instruction was to uh, go to the scene at Lockerbie and use my experience and knowledge to try and uh, uh, decide whether this uh, crash was accidental or whether in actual fact it was a result of a criminal act. The debris and carnage caused by this accident stretched for 800 square miles 
and in fact two separate trails of debris were determined during the investigation. These trails had a gap of between two and three miles between them. This is Thundergarth Church and Graveyard and it's opposite the church in the field over the wall that the great nose cone of the Jumbo 747 landed on the Wednesday night. On the Thursday, I came up with my team. The nose cone was there, rescuers were there, the media were there, and I took time to enter the nose cone, which was quite vast, and uh, sad to record, uh, many of the crew were still in the places, in their places within the nose cone. In Lockerbie, speculation was at fever pitch. How could a jumbo jet just fall out of the sky? Was it accidental or deliberate? The 747 was old, one of the first to be built. It had flown 72,000 hours and completed over 16,000 flights. The fear that a structural failure of the world's largest airliner was responsible for the carnage in Lockerbie played on the minds of detectives and air investigators arriving in the traumatised town. The scene that greeted me on arrival at Lockerbie was the most harrowing scene I have ever witnessed. We were told, first and foremost, that we, that we were to search for bodies and we were to do it in a thorough and dignified manner. Secondly, we were then to search for personal belongings and thirdly, we were to search for pieces of aircraft. Distressing as it was, the search for clues began with the bodies of the dead. The bodies were taken to a temporary mortuary in the town, where a team of pathologists waited to examine them. It is essential that you investigate the bodies, you look at the bodies thoroughly to pick up clues, perhaps even trace evidence of what actually happened, and from that, helping to reconstruct what actually took place. For example, if somebody was in direct contact with the bomb or very close to it, there might have been primary missile injuries. Bits of the bomb, actually bits of the bomb, bits of the circuitry perhaps, would have been embedded in people who were sitting in the seats above the bomb or sitting close to the bomb. But the examination of the bodies gave up no clues, and the frantic search for evidence now turned to the aircraft debris. This is the home territory of air investigators worldwide, and within 24 hours of the destruction of Pan Am 103, British air investigators had been joined by their American counterparts. Among them was the Mr. Bomb of air investigation, Walter Korsgaard from the Federal Aviation Administration. The first day he arrived, he was dressed in yellow oilskins. Day one, day two, day three, Walter always arrived on scene with the yellow oilskins on. As a result of that, he was affectionately called the Banana Man. During a lifetime of searching for and testing out explosives, the Banana Man has blown up more aircraft than terrorists, blown himself up, and been deafened in both ears. The moment he set foot in Lockerbie, he wanted to brief the search crews on the telltale signs of bomb damage. But this was a sensitive suggestion to the investigation manager he approached. Politically, he didn't think it was a smart idea to start talking about bombs too early because if it occurs uh, and the UK government is responsible for the screening, this could be a problem. So he said, well, I'd rather not uh, do that just now. And of course, as soon as the meeting was over, all the supervisors that were going to run these search lines got me off to one side and said, um, hey, what are we really looking for? And I said, uh, well, you know, you come down to the room and we'll uh, go over it. So we ran a little private seminar. Coast Guard showed the search chiefs his little traveling collection, bits of bombed aircraft he's investigated over the years. They all showed the telltale signs of sooting and the distinctive jagged edges, unlike any mechanical tear. 
we wanted them to look for pieces of metal with those characteristics plus gas washing craters, which is little craters in the metal that uh, look like a typical bomb crater, actually, uh, but they're very tiny. But you can see them with your naked eye, usually. Mr. Korsgaard was to be a godsend because with his knowledge of damage to aircraft, etc., I decided that when I was out in my scientific team, he should be a member of that. And the two of us set up a great rapport as we set about trying to establish what had caused the aircraft to crash. And so together, the Scottish forensic investigator and America's Mr. Bomb started in on the 800 square miles of crash site. That search would become one of the most thorough in the history of aircraft investigation. It was also one of the luckiest. On about the third day after we arrived at the incident, one of the individuals on one of the search lines uh, brought in a uh, piece of fuselage skin, uh, which was precisely what we were looking for. It was a piece of skin, oh, perhaps uh, 20 inches long, maybe eight inches high, uh, and it was bent toward the front of the airplane and had stayed there rather than bending back. If it were a mechanical breakdown of the airplane, pieces will splay out just like in an explosion, but they fold back in. In this case, with a bomb, it won't happen that way. When you think about it, the airplane is flying at 33,000 feet, it's probably 30 below zero or colder, and yet here it is hit by a bomb and the ball, the fireball, at about 5,000 to 8,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and it swings out into that cold air and it freezes there, you might say. And just as with Coast Guard's collection, that vital piece of Pan Am 103 had the sooting, the jagged edge, and the gas washing craters the telltale signs of explosion. At this point, on day three, Walter Korsgaard and myself knew without any shadow of doubt that we were now dealing with a criminal act rather than an accidental crash. We took that uh, piece of metal directly to the individual in charge of the overall management of the incident and explained to him that uh, if he had it tested by a lab, he would surely find that it was, in fact, evidence that there had been a bomb on Pan Am 103. Some pieces of wreckage are today being taken to the Royal Armament Research and Development Establishment at Fort Holstead in Kent for more detailed examination to determine whether they exhibit evidence of a pre-impact explosion. And they flew it down to the lab at 9 o'clock that night we got the word back that there were explosive residues and they were gas washing craters that we were looking at and the jagged edge was positive proof. The destruction of Pan Am 103 was immediate. The devastation total. But contrary to popular belief, Pan Am 103 was statistically unlucky. Yeah, most people think that uh, any size bomb in an aircraft uh, will probably bring it down. Actually, if you look at the record, three quarters of turbine powered aircraft, that is pure jet airplane, survive bomb. And that's, a, that's historic. So how was it that Pan Am 103 was blasted into a million pieces? To find out, the investigators decided to blow up some aircraft. It turned out that where the Lockerbie bomb had been planted was critical. The tests revealed that the forward cargo hold where the Lockerbie bomb went off is a particularly sensitive area in wide-bodied jets. The way the 747 is designed, I believe, makes that airplane most vulnerable to a bomb in the cargo hold. Uh, 
for example, there's tremendous space between the outside walls of the uh, uh, cargo hold and the cargo containers themselves. And these spaces allow gases to travel and do damage in places where in another airplane they couldn't do that type of a job. This bomb was not placed in that airplane specifically in a given slot. It was randomly put in the airplane. It probably ended up in the worst possible place in the baggage hold. The consequences of the loss of Flight 103 were huge. Pan Am went out of business, while the US government, under pressure from the families of the Lockerbie dead, spent millions building this security research laboratory. It's dedicated to preventing another Lockerbie. Back in uh, 89, the year following Pan Am 103 incident, I was involved in actual research testing that was done with the UK, the Scottish, the FBI, and the FAA here in the States to demonstrate the type of damage that was done in the uh, Pan Am 103. As a result of those tests, the FAA was set a number of targets. One was to develop equipment that could actually identify Lockerbie-sized quantities of explosives hidden in passengers' luggage. By borrowing from technology first used in hospital body scanners, researchers developed a new type of airport machine. It scans and maps a bag's contents, analyzes them, identifies any explosive and any object it's hidden in. The uh, system here, the CTX-5000, is designed to actually look for the bomb quantity explosive before it gets on the aircraft. We have done extensive testing, both with uh, suitcases without explosive and suitcases with explosives, all military and commercial explosive. This bag has a, uh, a two-speaker cassette radio. You'll notice that the uh, two-speaker magnets are on the lower part of the picture. The uh, red object is the uh, explosive, which is concealed inside the uh, radio cassette player. It has determined that it's a military type explosive. The mass is approximately 900 grams and the density is 1.4 grams per cubic centimeter. Clever the new machine may be, but it has been bought by just a handful of airports and most of those American. Another consequence of Lockerbie was the development of a luggage container that should a bomb get on board will resist the kind of blast that downed Pan Am 103. This is an LD-3 container, which is used in nearly all wide-body aircraft, and indeed in the 747, like Lockerbie. These two units are the same size, but they're hardened containers, which have been developed by the uh, research and development money for the FAA and they both have withstood the amount of explosive used in Lockerbie or even larger. Recently a visit from the uh, families of the victims of Pan Am 103, one of the gentlemen commented that if we had these containers in Pan Am 103 that his daughter could very well be alive today. But blast-resistant containers are not in use even today. So far, they are simply prototypes. The history of crimes in the sky is littered with near misses. The little known story of FedEx Flight 705 is one where the outcome could have been even more destructive than at Lockerbie. 
In just 25 years, FedEx has built up the world's best known pickup and delivery business. It operates over 600 aircraft, it's the world's largest cargo fleet, and from its nerve center in Memphis, employs 3,500 pilots to fly them. One of those pilots was Auburn Calloway, a 43-year-old U.S. Navy-trained flyer. In April 1994, Calloway was working as a FedEx flight engineer on the company's fleet of wide-bodied DC-10s. Richard Boyle is a Vietnam veteran who has flown for FedEx since it first took off 25 years ago. In April 1994, he was Auburn Calloway's captain. They flew together on long-haul flights across the states. Well, Auburn didn't have a good reputation of the company because he, he just rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. Uh, I think it might have been first impressions. My first impression of Auburn wasn't a positive one either. But once I got to know him, we got along fine. But uh, uh, many, many of the captains did not like to fly with Auburn. Calloway was not only unpopular, he was also under investigation. FedEx believed Calloway had lied to them about his Navy flying time. Calloway believed FedEx were out to get him because he was black. He felt that he was being persecuted by one of our flight managers. He, he felt it was a personal vendetta. And that's one thing FedEx will not tolerate, and that's someone lying uh, uh, regarding their, their credentials. So if he lost his job at FedEx, he would never get hired by another major air carrier. I mean, his aviation career with any good company was basically over. Fellow flyer and Memphis newspaper man Dave Hirschman discovered more about Calloway's paranoid character. During the time that he was in the Navy, he kept a book of all the slights and all the indignities and every perceived injustice that anyone had ever perpetrated against him. And he kept that book, and he kept that, that the little black leather bound book and added to it um, on an almost daily basis. A lifetime of slights wore Calloway down. He decided to end his life. In a farewell note he wrote, I have battle fatigue badly. It's my time to go. But Calloway had no intention of going quietly. Calloway's plan was to knock out Federal Express. To, he, wanted to, he wanted to strike at the very nerve center of this very complex worldwide global organization. And his method of doing that was to commandeer a DC-10, fully loaded with fuel, and to, to, uh, to crash that airplane into the FedEx nerve center at Memphis International Airport. When you think about a 500,000 pound jet with 100,000 pounds of jet fuel on board, moving at over 350 miles per hour, and, uh, and targeted at a particular location, the devastation would have been incalculable. FedEx has a long-standing policy. Any member of staff can fly free on any FedEx flight in the aircraft's jump seat, which is right behind the pilot on the aircraft flight deck. On April the 7th, 1994, Auburn Calloway buckled himself into the jump seat of FedEx Flight 705, a DC-10 loaded with electronics for California's Silicon Valley. The wide-bodied jet took off from runway 9 at Memphis Airport at 3.02 that afternoon. Part of Callaway's plan was for his family to benefit from the company's life insurance scheme. But to be sure the policy paid out, he needed to make his suicide attack on his employer look like an accident. What he intended to do was to use hammers to incapacitate the crew. And, and you know, hammers may seem like a, like a primitive weapon, but when you think about it, it's the perfect weapon. The wounds that they would cause would be every bit as devastating as gunshots. And later, when forensic experts examined the wreckage, they would find crew members with fractured skulls, but those injuries are totally consistent with an airline crash. 
26 minutes after takeoff, at 19,000 feet, Callaway took up his hammer. Unsuspecting in the cockpit were his FedEx colleagues, Captain David Sanders, First Officer Jim Tucker, and Flight Engineer Andy Peterson. And the first thing he does is he, he delivers two devastating hammer blows to uh, Andy Peterson. Andy Peterson was seated with his back to Callaway, and he was hit twice. And the impact of these hammer blows, they fractured uh, Peterson's skull and severed the temporal artery on, on the top of his scalp. Jim Tucker was, was turning his head to the left to ask Peterson if he could identify the noise. And at that time, he was struck with an, with a, an absolutely devastating blow. Uh, the hammer is a 20-ounce Stanley, Stanley framing hammer, and it, it, it actually went through his skull, right about where he would have parted his hair. The hammer went into his brain, and, and Tucker was immediately paralyzed on one side of his body. He was losing vision. The impact of this blow literally bounced his, his face off of the, the instrument panel in front of him. David Sanders was still strapped into his seat. He had his hands up over his head. He was, he, was, uh, sh he was moving in his seat trying to ward off these hammer blows. And he was struck several times. Uh, one, of the, one of the blows nearly severed his ear, his right ear. Callaway expected these guys to be dead from, the, from these mortal wounds that he had delivered, but instead that they were still alert and they were shouting to each other and exhorting each other to fight back. Calloway's plan was going wrong, and he retreated from the cockpit in panic. The blood-spattered Sanders and Peterson forced themselves out of their seats and went after him. They found Calloway holding a Magnum underwater spear gun, which he'd carried on board in a guitar case. The spear gun was his trump card, and he pointed it at Sanders, the captain, and he said, this is a real gun, I'll kill you. And he, and he implored them to cooperate with what, with what he was doing. It was at, at this point that Tucker took the most extraordinary action. Tucker had enough presence of mind to take the aircraft with one hand and almost turned it upside down, which threw everyone in the back on top of Auburn Calloway, which gave them a little bit of an advantage. Uh, the fact he did that with a crushed skull and only half his body functioning is just phenomenal. While Captain Sanders and Flight Engineer Peterson grappled with Calloway, Tucker raised the alarm. When we received the call, you know, it just came across the frequency as emergency. Yeah, so now we have the job of determining who is it that has the emergency. Aircraft with emergency, say again. To me. Okay, aircraft with emergency, say again. When we uh, question, you know, aircraft with emergency, say again, well, apparently at the same time we were saying that, the uh, they were trying to call us once again. Well, as we did that, our two transmissions blocked each other out, and so all we heard was like the last uncy of, of emergency. Hey, aircraft with emergency, say again. This time, you know, he came back and, and uh, announced that it was, you know, FedEx 705. Express 705. I've been wounded. We've had an attempted uh, takeover on board the airplane. Give me a vector, please. That's in Memphis at this time. Hurry. The last one we would have expected the emergency to come from was probably the FedEx plane. Star says 705 flying 095, direct Memphis. A minute or so went by and then uh, I got another call and it said, uh, where's the airport? Keep me advised, where is Memphis? Express 705 uh, flighting of uh, 090 and uh, the airport's at 43 miles, 12 o'clock. I said, it's 12 o'clock and, you know, so many miles. And he said, what direction? Wait a second, you know, what direction? You know, he was westbound heading for California, and, and uh, now he's pointed back at the airport, and he didn't know what direction he's flying. Uh, Express 705, you're uh, eastbound at this time, and it'll be about uh, 12.30, 1 o'clock. Look, just keep talking to me, okay? Jim Tucker is using this aircraft as a weapon, and uh, he's flying it in, in, a, in a way that it's never been flown before, but the purpose is... To, to, uh, to let the crew have the upper hand. He assures them that he has control of the airplane and that they should get up and resist in any way that they can. Peterson and Sanders tried to pin Callaway to the galley floor, but their frenzied attacker was biting and lashing out with his hammer. Yeah, we need an ambulance and uh, 
We need uh, arms intervention as well. Alert the uh, airport facility. When I got him down as low as I thought I could you know, talk to him without uh, losing him on the uh, uh, communications equipment, uh, I uh, shipped him over to Memphis Approach. Press 705, we have an emergency. He's turning back direct Memphis. He had an attempted takeover. He is wounded at this time. He's had an attempted takeover? The affirmative. He's uh, north of Forest City by about eight miles at this time. He's at okay. 1,000 descending to 1,000. Okay, radar contact. And uh, you put him on 19-1. Uh, 19-1. Yeah. By now, all three crewmen were back in the galley struggling to overcome Callaway. No one was flying the plane. When he told them to change frequencies, I think they had it on altitude hold, and uh, they were all in the back in the struggle. Um, and I had tried to call them several times. Express 705, heavy map us out of here. Express 705, heavy map us out of here. Memphis, uh, can you hear me? Uh, is this Express 705 Heavy? 705, yes. Uh, 705 Heavy, uh, Memphis, Roger, I do hear you. You can proceed direct Memphis if able. Expect runway 9 or the altimeter is 302 9 -er. You understand we're declaring an emergency. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop it on the runway or we can. Express 705 Heavy, affirmative. All that's been taken care of. One of the first things you want to do in a hijacking is, is not make the situation any worse. Uh, you don't want to say anything that would... Uh, uh, anger the, the hijacker, you know, he's, hey, you want to ask him, hey, does the wacko have a gun, you know, and at that point, you know, I just might push him over the edge. And, so you don't want to make the situation any worse, and you want to give all the assistance you can to the, to the pilot, to the crew. Someone had to try and get the plane down. With First Officer Tucker and Flight Engineer Peterson on top of Callaway, Sanders forced himself back into his bloodied captain's seat. Sanders was alone in the cockpit making this, this, uh, this maximum speed approach and landing. He was under incredible duress because this fight was still going on. It would, it would ebb and flow. And at times the crew would think that they, that they had the attacker under control. And then the, then, uh, the fight would erupt all over again. Express 705, have you verify uh, situation still under control? Well, it's sort of under control. As he was coming in, uh, the aircraft was going faster, much faster than normal. There's a speed limit of 250 knots below 10,000 feet. Uh, I saw his uh, ground speed was about 350 knots, and I figured this guy wants to get home. Uh, that type of aircraft, you have to slow it down to make it descend. Otherwise, it doesn't descend very well. So it turns out he ended up too high for that runway. And at about 4,000 feet, probably, I don't know, four or five miles out, that's when he said, we're not going to make runway 9. We want 36 left. I'm coming around to uh, 36 left. OK, Express 705 Heavy, runway 36 left. Clear to land, clear visual approach, 36 right. left. You are clear to land. The wind is 050 at 8. All other flights into Memphis were diverted. Everyone prepared for the worst. Dave Sanders was trying to land on runway 9, but ended up very high and very fast, was incapable of putting the aircraft down on the runway. So what he did, he broke off the approach and literally turned like a fighter to a downwind at 3-6 left. The aircraft made a very high banking turn, almost perpendicular to the ground as it made the final and onto a final approach at the airport. I thought the aircraft was going to crash. I didn't think he could save the airplane in that configuration. The aircraft, as it made its approach, was going over a very highly populated uh, residential area. If the airplane had crashed there, it would have been uh, uh, conceivably loss of life and uh, property. It could have uh, flown into uh, buildings, terminal buildings, airplanes. And a particular concern to me was the very large uh, fuel storage tanks. If he hit that, there had been a huge explosion, uh, and it had been quite a catastrophe. The pilot made a beautiful recovery, landed right on the runway, hit very hard, slammed on his brakes and came to a complete stop. Exceptional piece of airmanship. You don't see that time of flying in a DC-10. A very nice piece of airmanship by a man who's very fatigued and very injured. Uh, it's quite phenomenal.
Paramedic David Teague was with a posse of emergency vehicles summoned the moment Flight 705 raised the alarm. He raced across the tarmac to the now stationary jet. We pulled up beside the plane, off in the grass, off on the right wing tip. The bloody three-man crew managed to land safely despite critical injuries. The captain was saying, somebody help us get somebody up here before he kills us all. Paramedics found the crew and suspect Callaway covered with blood. There was blood on the walls, uh, on the, the seats that were there. Uh, everybody in the cockpit was covered with blood. He had four grown men that were fighting for their lives in this confined area for about 30 or 40 minutes. Probably one of the bloodiest scenes that I've seen in my years with the fire department. The three-man crew and one other person were aboard, an off-duty FedEx pilot, Auburn Calloway, who was just along for the ride. I just asking, I guess out of my own curiosity, you know, why did you do something like this? And uh, you can just kind of tell when somebody's thinking, and he kind of had that look on his face, and after 15 or 20 seconds, he said, I guess it just went crazy. Auburn Calloway was jailed for life. All three pilots survived. They won awards for their bravery, but none of them has flown again. FedEx employees are still free to fly in the jump seats of the company's aircraft. The number of hijacks and bombings throughout the 1980s sent shivers through the aviation community. Something had to be done. In America, President Reagan set up an extraordinary flying security service to protect American lives in the air. At an airport near Atlantic City, a bizarre cast of characters climbs aboard a pensioned-off aircraft. The men behind the masks are U.S. Federal Air Marshals. They insisted on hiding their faces from our cameras. There are about a thousand of them. They are armed and they travel as normal passengers on U.S. flights around the world. You could be sitting next to one and you'd never know. Their mission? To stop the hijackers and the bombers. They practice as realistically as possible. Here, trainee marshals are being tested. They've got to pick just the right moment to shoot the hijacker, while making sure they don't hit a passenger. I told you not to look at me! Be quiet! Or I'll put you out of your misery! Okay. Don't move! Good. Ah! Ah! Don't move! Don't move! In the last 10 years, there have been no attempts to bomb or hijack American passenger aircraft. The air marshals believe that's probably down to them. One thing is certain. In a world of bombers, hijackers and air marshals, more people than ever carry weapons onto planes and are quite prepared to use them, with potentially deadly consequences for us all. The Channel 4 video black box is available.